right? Their production. Mainly, we are going to look into some of the novel approaches, right? In vaccine production and uh, the basic function of those vaccines and why they are important and what are the significance of them. Maybe we will look into some examples as well, right? So, a vaccine is defined as a any uh, biological component, right, which can pro pro provide a active acquired immunity. And I'm not sure, you might be, you may be studying this as well in your veterinary science as well. Uh, animals generally have different kinds of immunity. One is innate immunity, which is coming with you, right, once you are born, right, through generations. And the other one is adaptive immunity which is occurred when you are exposed to a specific disease. So you get that immunity, acquiring that immunity. So that is called as acquired, active acquired immunity. So that you are getting it by active process, not by passive process. You are getting the disease or disease material into your body and you are getting the immunity. So a vaccine is a biological component which gives you that opportunity to develop the immunity without getting the disease, right? So that is a vaccine. So that a vaccine should consist of specific molecule which resembles the agent of disease, etiological agent. It can be in any form. That agent or the disease agent can be in any form. It can be weakened disease agent or it can be a killed or a dead disease agent or microbe or it can be toxic some toxins associated with microbes, or it can be one of the components, maybe a surface protein, which can be recognized by our immune cells so that the acquired immunity is uh, elicited, right? So that is how a vaccine is made. So vaccine is a biological component which consists of any form of microbe which can elicit the immune response. So this is Vaccination is one of the best thing that has happened to human time as far as the medicine is concerned. Medical world and the health of the people are concerned. Because vaccination is or has created the opportunity for many people to live longer. Right? Not, uh, and it's a classic example for the wonder of science, if you can ask, right? So this is reducing the infectious diseases which has been identified in the early stages or early years as fatal, right? Causing massive mortality and morbidity as well. Some of these diseases such as polio has been creating uh, young age morbidity issues, right? So paralysis and things like that. So this vaccine, created an opportunity to eliminate those threats from the human kind. There are various examples of diseases which have been eliminated, at least more in more countries, by complete vaccination process. Say, for example, measles, smallpox, all these things have effective vaccines. So conventional vac uh, vac vaccines, uh, the problem with vaccines is there are some pathogens which are highly evolving. You know, they are changing rapidly. So the conventional vaccines gives you lifetime protection from these uh, many pathogens are not appropriate for some of the pathogens which are evolving rapidly. Say, for example, the flu virus, influenza. Influenza can be controlled by vaccination, but the impact of that vaccines can be very less. Oh, there are some diseases which are caused by viruses, certain viruses, which may not be uh, controlled by conventional vaccines. Say, for example, Ebola and Zika and dengue for that concept as well, because these viruses, they are complex, right? They have variants within themselves and circulating at the same time. So a novel approach 
so producing vaccine is warranted it's needed for these kinds of diseases so this is one of the success story polio you can see how it has affected uh, this is from usa alone right and you can see the graph right for 400000 people it's, it's not the total number it's maybe for the 100000 people so you can see the reduction in the polio and sri lanka has completely eliminated polio and india as well so it's it's a huge success right uh, reducing the kids from getting this kind of a disease which has life long impact it's a huge success right so this is a diagram showing how the vaccines work the traditional way so you can see we have listed uh, different kinds of vaccines here okay so this is live attenuated vaccines this is inactivated vaccine subunit vaccine toxicity and conjugate vaccine all these are conventional vaccine and you can see here this is what i just want you to see right here at the bottom how many years actually it will take to develop a conventional vaccine normally you can see it takes up to at least the maximum of 10 years to find the candidate vaccine first and then an additional of 3 to 6 years for the process valid, uh, validation as well as clinical trials then it will take up to another 2 years until it comes to market so the conventional vaccine production is a very long process gender right generally it takes very 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 long time but the biotechnology and molecular biology advances given the people to take up this process within years very short time right and we have seen that in covid 19 case as well and by the way the the, the two people involved with you have studied you know what's next generation sequencing right you know that next generation sequencing would have studied that right sequencing dna sequencing next generation sequencing is the whole genome sequencing using high throughput machine right and algorithm and the two people uh, who has involved in ngs have won one of the um, most uh, honored prize in science uh, i don't know, i have forgotten the name of the prize right uh, it's, it's 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 like oscar in science they said right it's, it's a very huge amount of money and uh, they have invented years back right maybe in 90s uh, but uh, they have been given this prize this year simply because ngs next generation sequencing allow the scientists to work on the covid-19 genome the viral genome not covid-19 the virus genome uh, in a very short period of time accurately and it's been continued so that may be the reason why they have got this prize right this year uh, so those kinds of advances in science have given the opportunity for the people to work on these vaccines very quick right but this is the traditional practice of producing that so as you can see it's the again it just gives you the clinical trial process and you can see the clinical trial process starts from the lab where it's called as pre clinical trial where you find a novel component to be associated with the vaccine and then you test in the lab animal first then you go for the phase 1 clinical trial phase 1 clinical trial includes volunteers right with very minimum number of people then you check the dosage and safety a bit of safety and then you go to the phase 2 clinical trial again you optimize the dosage there right for different population different gender here the diseased people will also be not diseased people i mean people with disease will also be acquired right in the phase 2 clinical trial and phase 3 clinical trial is the largest clinical trial 
where you get more people from different countries and things like that. And it is a comprehensive studies on the safety as well, not dosage. Safety study in the phase three clinical trial mostly. And the efficacy, of course, how efficient the vaccine. And once it is passing, then it, it gets approved and go to the manufacturing and marketing phase. And then also we will be having a kind of a trial. After marketing, it's called as a post-marketing clinical trial. Right? You will get safety issues right, recorded from different countries so that the vaccines, if needed, can be further improved. Right? So it, it, it is the normal process of clinical trial. So it generally takes up to 10 to 12 years. But COVID-19 vaccine has been developed within a very short period of time. So this is the uh, expected vaccine trials, clinical trials. Right? So from uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, the early phase start phases of vaccine development of COVID. So they expect it will come, the highest estimate was 24 months, that means two years, the shortest estimate was 11 months. And in fact, it has come, the COVID-19 vaccine has finished all the clinical trials within this, the shortest period of time. And it has come to the market within one. So such the advances in biotechnology approaches and the molecular biology and uh, specifically uh, the facilities to assess different kinds of molecules, right, with high-end equipment has made this possible, right? So before going into studying the different kinds of vaccines in animals or human, if you can call it, uh, we have different kinds of immunity. And I have told about the innate immunity, which is shown here, which is coming through uh, your parents and when you are born, you will be having this kind of immunity. Unless uh, some people are immunocompromised, right? They don't have enough immunity due to various diseases or genetic effects. But more or less, everyone will have innate immunity. First of all. That means it's direct. Any pathogen or foreign body come into the cells, these phagocytosis, uh, phagocytes will detect it and kill them, right? They may be specific or non-specific. And the adaptive immune response is governed by two different kinds of immune cells, which is known as B cells and T cells. And they are readily activated by the immune intermediate, right? Uh, there are receptors and things like that, proteins. And they will transfer the information and produce these B cells and T cells. They are called as memory cells. So that they can identify the pathogen when the pathogen comes next time. When you get it for the first time, you will have this B and T cell ready to fight for the pathogen again. So this is called as adaptive immune response. So as far as the vaccines are concerned, there are various types of vaccines produced based on the biological component inside. The first one is live attenuated. The second one is inactivated. Uh, the third component can be replicating or based on viral vectors, they can be replicating or non-replicating viral vectors. And the fourth kind can be subunit based, right? And the novel approaches can be DNA and RNA based virus. I mean, vaccine. Right? We will see one by one how, what are they and how they work. So live attenuated vaccine. Attenuation means you reduce the power of anything, right? You reduce the power of. So live attenuated vaccine is you reduce the activity of the virus or maybe pathogenicity of the virus. So how it is being done is whatever the pathogen, bacteria or virus have been attenuated by repeating them in a cell, cell line. So every, because these virus and bacteria, when they are infecting, in multiple cell lines, more or less, they will be reducing in pathogenicity. The same way. You don't introduce new virus, right? You get it, uh, say, for example, you start it from a cell line, right? You, you have multiple cell lines here, say, just like this. You introduce one virus here and make them replicate. 
and take those virus here and it goes on like that when it goes through several cell lines it will reduce the power of infection so this attenuated viruses or bacteria can be incorporated into the vaccine components vaccine components will consist of other chemicals or reagents or molecules other than the biological components it can be lipids or it can be salt or it can be adjuvants right additional molecule which needed for the elicitation of uh, immune response so these virus or bacteria attenuated bacteria bacteria or virus will be incorporated into vaccination probe so it will be injected and will create immune response and there is always a risk associated with using live virus even though it is attenuated in certain people who might have different immune responses due to various reasons this can cause side effects as well because they are live but more or less it's safe but there is always a risk associated with it but most of the vaccines are live attenuated vaccines we are using so the second type is inactivated vaccine inactivated vaccines doesn't contain live virus or live bacteria they contain killed virus particles right sometimes they can be incorporated into a non uh, harmful virus say for example it can be a normal virus adenovirus similar virus right so that there are some particles associated with your respondent virus if in this case covid 19 or covid 2 virus and means it will be packed into another virus so that this covid 2 virus is not alive but still there are molecules which can be recognized by our immune system and then it will be eliciting the immune response in our body and of course like attenuated virus this uh, inactivated vaccine also requires adjuvant and all the salt and lipids and everything to stabilize these molecules right and uh, sinopharm which we are getting is inactivated vaccine right and of course the other vaccine chinese vaccine based on sinovac is also inactivated uh, vaccine inactivated virus induced vaccine right and viral vector vaccines as i've told earlier it consists of two different types one is replicating viral uh, vectors uh, example is the measles vaccine it's uh, it's it's it, it can be but not measles vaccine it can be measles virus can be used to fight against another disease ebola disease right so the replicating viral vector has been tried in ebola vaccines and it it has not been approved but it is being tried and uh, the other one is non replicating viral vector non replicating viral vector will not continue the replicating component of the viral genome as you can see from here right so this you can see replicating viral genome the whole viral genome will be there right and this consists of corona virus spike protein which will have sorry which will have the spike gene sorry not spike protein spike gene which will create the spike protein which are recognized by our immune system but the virus is different here there won't be any other particle other than the coronavirus spike protein and these viral rest of the viral genome will be inactivated so this measles virus say for example if this is measles virus will have a coronavirus spike gene on one condition the rest of the measles viruses genome is there on the other condition the rest of the measles virus genome will be inactivated so these two approaches can induce similar response 
where both of them will go into the cell and replicate new viruses and our immune system will be respond to it, right? And this is about subunit vaccine, right? And also it is contains some different vaccines, viral vaccines, as well as combination of nanoparticle vaccines, which is, which is another different kind of thing. But when you think about subunit vaccine, it doesn't contain the whole organs. It will consist of whatever required to elicit the immunity. In this case, COVID-2 case, or COVID-2 virus case, or COVID-19 case, it will consist of the spike protein alone, right? Or maybe it can consist of the viral antigen itself. You know, viral will secrete an antigen when it enters into the body. Those antigens are directed by the antibody. So it can be spike protein, which is recognized by the cell in the membranes, or it can be the antigen itself. So the antigen can be detected by the antibody. Right? But the problem with subunit vaccine is they have they elicit poor cellular immune response. They don't have uh, the required capability of eliciting immune response, which are which are needed to. Uh, combat the disease, fight the disease. And also the last long lasting impact by those elicited immunity, that means by eliciting memory cells is also poor. So the approach which is being tried to eliminate these issues is the combination of viral vector along with the subunit using nanoparticle approach. So that they are protected one by nanoparticle and these nanoparticles are given the response of doing the viral DNA and RNA by adjuvant technology. Right? So this is a totally different approach which has not been tried and proposed. And as far as the DNA vaccine is concerned, DNA vaccines are developed just like what we have learned in a cloning process. You will be creating a plasmid with the specific antigen gene, right here. This is your antigen gene. So this is a bacterial plasmid. So once this is constructed or created, this plasmid will be delivered into the host cell. And we know the host cell can accept, there are various methods to introduce plasmids into the host cell. So this delivery system is also important. If the plasmid has a poor delivery system, uh, then these vaccines won't, won't work. So once they are inside the cell, these plasmids will start to replicate and produce the antigen because they will consist of all the required elements to do translation and transcription process. So inside the cells, this plasmid will do the transcription protein synthesis process. And once they are synthesized, the antigens will be there. And antigens, once they are produced, will be recognized by the host immune system by specific antibodies. And that will create the immunity. Right? This is another detailed diagram showing the same, right? You will get the DNA, right? And transcribed into different kinds, right? And you, you can construct this DNA into the plasmid and this plasmid can be thrown into the purification phase, right? So this is about the production of DNA vaccine. Unfortunately, no DNA vaccine has been tested for humans. There are various uh, factors associated with one is it is DNA. So there is always a chance that DNA might be interfere with our DNA. So the risk is there by DNA vaccine. But it has been tested for one virus in hosts for West Nile virus. Right? It has been approved by FDA, Food and Drug Administration, to be used in horses. 
against West Nile virus. If, if it is safe, if it is uh, I mean, proved to be safe in all these uh, veterinary diseases, and I'm hopeful that one day we'll be having DNA vaccines, uh, which are much more specific, right? And we will have these advantages of DNA, right? So no risk of infection for infection by virus, because we don't have any viral particle here. Others, we just clone the antigen gene and insert into the plasma. So we don't have any infectious particle into this vaccine. And it can, uh, it can uh, induce the MHC class and MHC class, sorry, class one and class two molecules, right? Those are histo uh, pathology, histochemical uh, components or complexes, major histochemical compo complexes, right? Associated with cell membrane. Class one is found in most of the cells except RBC. And class two is found in only immune cells. And these DNA-based uh, vaccines can activate both these classes. And they can polarize the T cell, right, towards type 1. Type 1 and type 2 is, again, type 1 is the normal uh, responses, non-specific immune responses, like allergic, things like that, inflammation responses. And type 2 responses are more target-oriented, memory-based responses. Right? So they can induce both these types of response. So immune responses only focus on antigen. So we don't have any other molecule, so we don't have any unnecessary immune responses induced by this vaccine. And it's easy to develop and produce. Right? We, if you know the antigen, you just need to clone the antigen gene and insert into a viable plastic. That's it. Right? And stability is also high compared to the RNA, right? And it is very, very cost effective because antigen can be purified and sequenced and synthesized within very short time, unlike other attenuated and uh, inactivated viral based uh, vaccines. And we don't need any other adjuvants as well, right? So it's just simple plasmid purified in a medium. And you can just insert into a human or any cells. And long, long term persistence, right? It, it, it can persist for relatively long term, right? The immune response because DNA can be found inside cell for long term, right? When, uh, compared to R. So it, it also uh, more closely resembling the eukaryotic genome structure. Right? And additional molecules required for post translational modification, which is not found in prokaryotes, are also attached to this plasmid. So it, it will behave more like a eukaryotic genome rather than a prokaryotic So the next type is RNA vaccine. So RNA vaccine is considered as wonder of this. Year or maybe last two years because RNA vaccines created the most efficacious or efficacious vaccines for COVID 19. So, RNA vaccines consist of mRNA, messenger RNA. You know what is an mRNA because you have studied your protein synthesis. And mRNA are packed inside a particle, right? And these particles are made up of fat molecules. So these particles are inserted into the cell, and these cells absorb the mRNA, and you know mRNA will be translated So in the cytoplasm. So when they go into the cell, in the cytoplasm, they will find their ribosomes and getting translated. And they will produce only a portion of spike protein, not the whole spike protein, only a portion of spike protein. And this portion of spike protein will be recognized by the specific cellular membrane. And they will bind to it and they will produce the required immune response. So once again, there is no virus, right? And it's just a piece of MR. 
this diagram explains how it works and what steps are involved in the production. So you can see here, the first diagram, you will get the you RNA required synthesis. So you will get a protein, spike protein, and you make a DNA which can make a spike protein, synthesize the DNA, and you do a transcription to get a single strand MRNA. Right, so you will get a single strand MR, or else you may get a double strand MR. There is always possible, right? You will get a single strand RNA or double strand RNA. Double strand RNA can also be possible by various mechanisms, right? And but the single strand RNA, which is used in the process will have all the components required for the translation process. It will have the ORF, open reading frame, which consists of the coding region and UTR, untranslated regions at five prime and three prime. And it will have a five prime cap region as well as three prime polyadenine region or poly A region, right? Which these are the basic components required for the transcription and translation process. And once it is getting into the RNA, this will be readily translated. So this mRNA will be going into the cell here and they will be released in the, inside the fat molecule. And some of them will be going directly to the uh, ribosome and getting translated. And some of them might be degraded. That is also possible because this is a foreign RNA. So some of the cellular RNAs or some of the RNA ACEs inside the cell will be recognizing them and remove them because we also have post transcriptional modifications and controlling pathway inside our cells. So, inside the cell, cell, cell uh, yeah, inside the cytoplasm, we'll be having our enzymes and molecules ready to detect any foreign or unnecessary RNA and they'll be ready. Or they, they will be discarded, and some of them will be going and produce the antigen protein. Again, these antigen proteins, some of them might be discarded and released, or some of them might be compact into the Golgi bodies, right, by package. And once they are released, these released molecule will be recognized by our immune cells. So this is how the mRNA vaccine might work. Right, and here it, uh, the C explains the localized immune response because this is, we are speaking about the, the desired immune response. There may be localized immune response as well because when we are injecting into the muscular cells, right, intramuscular injection, then there will be localized responses as well, which is based on normal inflammatory pathways or interferon based pathways. All these are localized immune response. And some of them are in, uh, influenced by cytokine production. Right? Cytokines, you may know that cytokines are cellular molecules which are important to elicit immune response. When they are cytokines are produced inside a cell, there will be aggressive immune response. That is good. But in the case of COVID-19, the production of cytokine, not by vaccine. Normal cases of COVID-19, cytokine production is thought to be one of the responsible reasons for many deaths. Because when people get COVID-19, uh, some of them are getting a phenomenon known as cytokine storm. You know what a storm is? Uh, you know what a storm is, right? You get more cytokine produced for some reason. And when the more cytokines then are produced, it will be aggressive immune response. This aggressive immune response sometimes can kill people because it can uh, necro. I mean, it can kill the unnecessary cells as well. This immune response. So this is a localized immune response created by uh, mRNA vaccine. This is what the desired immune response is. 
So this is imported, right? This is straightforward, and you can see there is no additional viral particles involved. Only we have the antigen protein secreted by the MR, right? And this is very simple as well, the localized response. If you talk about the RNA vaccines, we can talk about a couple of breakthroughs. The first breakthrough came in 1990 because this is where the first in vitro transcribed mRNA occurred. When they have in, in, uh, inject mRNA into a mice and they have found the protein was produced. And 1992, also another uh, important thing because a uh, similar thing has been uh, tried inside a very delicate organ, uh, brain, inner rat, rat as well. So they have found that this mRNA can be induced, uh, used to induce response in any kinds of cells. And this diagram will give you additional information about the breakthroughs happened over different years, right? Uh, so you can read it. Uh, I don't want to read that, right? I will share the presentation. You can read that. So why mRNA vaccine is important? Because there are various factors supporting the mRNA vaccine. The first is safety. It doesn't contain any unnecessary pathogenic components. And mRNA is degraded by normal cellular process. The half-life of mRNA or the lifetime of mRNA, if you can call it, lifespan of mRNA is within hours. mRNA cannot withstand inside a cell more than, say, a day, at least the max. So it is an advantage as well as a disadvantage as well. So there are researchers going on to make sure that the mRNA may be long, lasting long, maybe one week or something like that, so that it can continuously producing antigen, so that the immune response is much stronger. Efficacy is because you can modify them as far as you want, right? because they are very small molecules. So you can modify them and they are highly translatable as well. And you should understand, um, you might be knowing that there are two mRNA vaccines available in around the world. The one is from Pfizer, the other one is from Moderna. Uh, Pfizer vaccine has to be stored in minus 80 degrees Celsius and Moderna vaccine can be stored in normal freezer. You know why? Both of them are mRNA vaccines. Why do you think there is a disparity in storage temperature between these two similar vaccines? Anyone? All right. <laughs> Moderna has a patented technology for lipid nanoparticles, which covers this mRNA vaccine. And we have seen that the lipid layer is covering the mRNA. So they have a patented technology for nanoparticle-based lipid cover, which can be stored, which can protect the mRNA at lower temperature, not lower, higher temperature. So that's why they have this storage issues sorted out. Right, and uh, of course, you you should know that Moderna is a very new company. This is their first product. The COVID nineteen vaccine is their first product, and the advantage of them is they had this lipid nanoparticle technology. So, as a biotech company, if you have a technology which is novel and which is patented, uh, then it's huge, right? And uh, they they were given huge amount of money by USA government to initiate this COVID-19 vaccine because they know that they can be successfully do that because they have this nanoparticle technology dedicated. So this can be uh, efficiently delivered, right? And uh, there is no uh, anti-vector immunity. This is another term you, should, you may be, uh, I don't know whether you, you are familiar with. Uh, there are when you use live attenuated vector or 
inactivated vector-based vaccines or viral replicating, replicating vector-based vaccines or even DNA vector-based vaccines. Sometimes people may get immune response for the vectors as well, which is rare, but there is a possibility. Hence, this RNA doesn't have any vectors or even any living other stuff. There is always uh, no risk of anti-vector immune response. Right? And they can be administered repeatedly. There is no risk of infection and things like that. You just uh, induce mRNA, which is... Uh, people are afraid of that mRNA vaccine can alter the DNA, which is not possible at all. As far as we know, we don't... I mean, as far as not we, everyone knows, right? There is no molecule identified which can carry mRNA or any RNA into the nucleus inside the cell. Up to now, we don't know anything about this MR, whether any RNA will be carried back into the nucleus. The only possible pathway is from the nucleus to cytoplasm. So there is less risk that the RNA will be going into the nucleus as well. Where most of our DNA, all of our DNA, except our mitochondrial DNA, is there. So there is no risk of that as far as now, right? Or we know. And production is also very rapid. Inex inexpensive and you can uh, do it in a massive scale as well. And these are some of the uh, commercially available or tested mRNA vaccines, right? Available, at least available within next 10 years, 12 years, right? You can see some of them are huge diseases, say Ebola, cancer. Uh, mRNA not only tested in vaccine, it is tested for uh, treatment as well, lung cancer, right, HIV, uh, right, there are various, because mRNA vaccines, RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines are perfectly targeted for cancer. When they develop this technology, they want this to be the breakthrough in cancer disease cure, right, but now it has been expanded to all the other diseases and uh, it is uh, is being tested for different diseases as well, right? This table will give you an idea about the potential of RNA-based vaccine. Uh, so these challenges are also there. There may be unintended effects. There is a possibility that it can create unintended immune reaction, and we have seen that in COVID-19 vaccines as well. Uh, which is unfortunate, but there is always side effect by any other vaccine. And mRNA vaccines will also have that risk of uh, creating unintended immune response. And uh, how we can minimize this, we can do that by synthesizing this mRNA, which is very close to mammalian, uh, very similar to the mRNA uh, created by mammalian cells, so that it no longer will be recognized as a foreign one. Delivery uh, is again, I was talking about this, it is very having very short lifespan. So we have to have additional molecules, maybe, right, to add it into the mRNA vaccine to stabilize them as well. So another challenge is storage. And this is why Pfizer vaccine has not been imported into the country at the earlier stages, because we don't have countries like Sri Lanka or poor developing countries, they don't have a required cold chain facility, minus 70 facility to transport and store vaccine. So with those countries, it's, these vaccines have very limited use. Right? So that's the end of